church in Africa, different levels. When I was asked to speak about this topic, I thought that what I better would start this presentation and discussion than to share my own personal story, especially concerning that my own life has been in fact impacted by ordinary women. And these women are two women. One is my mother, and another one is my big sister. So growing up in a, a, a household that is typically um, an African family with many household members in it, or at every given time, at least in the household where you grow up, uh, it had over 10 people in that household. And I saw my mother taking care of each and every person in that household and ensuring that everyone is happy in that household. She didn't care so much about her own needs and her own happiness. Uh, but she co uh, constantly talked about the dream she had for her children. She, wasn't, uh, she didn't have much formal education herself, but she had one dream, and that dream was that her own children, and especially her daughters, would get a formal education. Uh, somehow she understood the importance of education and quality education. And growing up, I kept hearing her negotiating with my father about prioritizing my own education and not just any education, but quality education. And it's because of that that I am who I am today. And when my family, my father and, and, and mother couldn't continue to pay for my education, my big sister, who was a student at that time and only had a part-time job, enabled me to pay my education throughout secondary school, but also undergraduate university. And so for me, it's like, you have very limited resources, but you are able to use those resources to make an impact in one's life. And for me, that is really women making change, ordinary women making extraordinary, uh, uh, doing extraordinary things. And uh, uh, as Nora said, I'm Rwandan, but I grew up in, uh, and born in Uganda. And when I returned in Rwanda in 1995, after the 1994 Rwandan genocide that I'm sure most of you have heard about, I saw women, at that time, uh, women were 70% of the Rwandan population. And I saw women, ordinary women, with very limited resources, with limited opportunities, in fact transforming and restructuring their own families, uh, their own communities, but also their nation. Today, Rwandan parliament has the highest women of, of members of parliament that are women globally, so they have the highest number of women in parliament. And for me, it didn't just happen. It happened because of the potential that women showed. There was, there's a slogan in Rwanda that people always say that women can do it. You know, that whatever, a man, <laughs> that, uh, uh, whatever a man can do, a woman can do. Yeah. So uh, just remove the stigmatization and discrimination against women, especially in the area of politics. So with that, I'll turn to my presentation. And my presentation really is going to, to focus on, on FemNet and the work that I'm doing with FemNet and uh, through working with different women, uh, what we've been able to achieve uh, and impact the change in different uh, areas of Africa. Uh, so um, FemNet is a Pan-African women's rights organization. It's a, a regional organization. It has a secretary in Nairobi, uh, Kenya, but we have members in over uh, 40 countries in Africa, in all the sub-regions of Africa, Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, Central Africa, Northern Africa, and uh, Western Africa. Uh, so we have a representation of, of women's rights organizations in different countries. And how we work is, is, is a network. And so we, we depend on each other's uh, our capacities and, and experiences and, and, and different expertise to build a network that is vibrant, that we can uh, count on each other in terms of uh, having a stronger voice to advocate for women's rights and gender uh, equality issues at different levels, both at the regional, at the national level, but also at the global level, as you are going to see in my presentation. Um, yeah. Uh, so this picture is just a demonstration of how the uh, uh, kind of women we work with are, uh, in fact, a, di a diverse group of women coming from different communities, different countries in Africa. And uh, if you hear about Africa, at least you are going to hear that Africa is raising, but also you are going to hear that Africa is young. 
Uh, it's rising because of different characteristics that are happening on the continent right now. We have been having an increased GDP for the past uh, years uh, in all different countries of Africa, an increased GDP uh, in terms of economic growth, uh, but seeing it's very little in terms of uh, shared shared benefits of growth. So we have a situation of increased GDP that does not necessarily mean that there is increased well-being of, of, of citizens, but women in particular. Uh, so what, what that means is that we have increased GDP, but increased inequalities also, where uh, poorer are becoming poorer and the richer are becoming and the rich are becoming even richer, and the women tend to fall in the category of those that are becoming poorer. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a youth gouge or youth uh, demographic dividend, and the situation is that you know we are seeing uh, this youth uh, gouge as uh, as an opportunity for Africa. In fact, to use these young people as a resource to ensure that there is development in Africa, uh, there is a lot of focus on creating jobs for young people, uh, but very limited space for the youth to thrive and to uh, have a voice and do whatever they want to do. That component is very limited, and especially with the Arab Spring that you know about, mm -hmm. uh, where the youth are the ones that led that revolution. Now there's a lot of caution in different African countries uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, very careful on what youth can bring about, and as a result we are seeing, you know, different uh, even laws put in place to limit voice, to limit uh, freedom of speech, freedom of association, and those kind of things. There's also a lot of focus on economic, on, on economic empowerment, and we are seeing this also uh, when you talk about women empowerment. That, in fact, what we are seeing, especially from the government, is that they tend to look at, they tend to look at uh, empowerment from a narrow kind of perspective. Uh, that is different from how we look at uh, uh, empowerment because for us we look at empowerment uh, to be more holistic, to include not just economic aspect but social aspect, political aspect, the environment, development that in fact is holistic in nature and empowers a, a person as a whole. Uh, however, we tend to see more focus on economic empowerment versus other kind of empowerment. Uh, and, and I'll elaborate that uh, further in other slides. Uh, but also we have seen a lot of discover of minerals in different parts of Africa, in different countries like Kenya, Uganda, Sudan, and many others. And so I think what we can ask ourselves is to what extent are these discover of minerals, which is such a, a big resource, uh, and, uh, to what extent are they impacting the lives of African citizens or African people? Uh, and uh, so, uh, and what we are seeing is that in fact it tends to be uh, impacting the lives of the private sector and mainly foreign investors uh, who get tax exemptions, for example, uh, at, at the expense of small business owners, uh, who, who mean uh, women, at the expense of small farmers, uh, but also it tends to uh, benefit a few politicians in different countries. Um, so turning uh, to the uh, women as agents of change, uh, one of the key things that we do to impact change uh, as feminist working with different African women is uh, policy advocacy. And so with policy advocacy, we have been able to achieve a lot, and we do policy uh, uh, advocacy at the regional level, mainly working with regional bodies such as African Union. Um, and, uh, and as a result, we have been able to, uh, to ensure that we influence African Union at that level to pass policies that are favorable for women's rights and gender equality, uh, but also working at uh, the, uh, ensuring that this then translates into the policy change at the national level. Uh, so for example, one of the things that have, uh, have come out of the work that we've done policy advocacy is Maputo Protocol in short, which is in full the African uh, chapter on, on people and women's rights in Africa. So this is like the, the version of CEDO, because CEDO is something that talks widely about uh, women's rights uh, at the global level, but then this focuses on women's rights in Africa. It's homegrown, so it is easier to use as a tool to hold the government accountable on addressing gender inequalities and women's rights issues because it is homegrown, it was passed and adopted 
by African uh, heads of states. Uh, and and FEMLET played a big role in terms of ensuring that the adoption was effect, uh, the the drafting of the of, of, of the policy was uh, effective and in fact took uh, into consideration issues affecting African women, uh, but also ensuring that different heads uh, of states uh, ratify and sign uh, this protocol. So as we speak, we have 36 ratification, which is the highest. Uh, African Union Convention that is ratified by many um, governments and it is because of the work that FEMNE together with the other uh, coalitions and organizations mm. have done in advocating for this specific policy uh, but also some declarations, some declarations mainly six uh, to address uh, <coughs> issues of uh, gender discrimination and inequalities, seeking for uh, gender parity at a different level. So this is again an important tool that is being used to uh, promote gender equality and women's rights. But also my plan of action on sexual reproductive health and rights, this is also something that was passed that specifically focuses on uh, addressing issues around sexual reproductive health and rights of women and girls. Um, so using this uh, regional uh, policy that have been passed, then we are able to, in fact, go to the national level, work with different members to ensure that, in fact, these get to be translated at the national level uh, through, for example, ensuring that the national constitutions are engendered. So if you see that the, 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 the constitution that have been passing lately, at least each one of them will have a clause that talks about non-discrimination based on any identity, including gender, um, ethnicity and all different uh, age and other differences. Uh, but also, almost all countries have laws on ending violence against women uh, and girls. Uh, again, how we have been impacting change is through speaking out uh, for change, uh, where especially things happen that we feel that are in fact uh, discriminating or, or marginalizing women and girls. And for example, you might know what happened in Nigeria where uh, uh, over 200 girls were abducted and up to now are still missing. Uh, so Feminet was one of different um, organizations that mobilized at the continental level uh, and had a series of speaking out, protesting, going to the in different embassies, going to governments in Nigeria, working with <coughs> members in Nigeria to advocate uh, to ensure that girls uh, are, are returned home safely. Much has, uh, not much has been done, but we believe that just with this kind of campaign and advocacy, uh, something similar will not happen in the future. Um, another situation is uh, another campaign that we call Justice for Liz. This is a girl, a 16 year old girl, who was gang raped in um, a, a community in Kenya called Busia. Uh, this girl was gang raped when she was coming from a barrier of, uh, of her family member. And uh, she went to report to the police, and the police, and she was able to identify the people that uh, raped her. And the police only told the boys to slash grass and leave. And that was a punishment in our, in our understanding. So when we learned about that, it was such an acceptable issue. And we started a campaign where we. Um, it, in fact, it went on VAS. I don't know if you have heard about VAS, which is like an online network that amplifies campaigns and ensuring that many people, not across mm -hmm. Africa but globally, uh, 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 sign the petition. So we had uh, over one million signatures that we collected. And we delivered those to the Inspector General of Police in Kenya. And we said, this is unacceptable. A girl cannot be raped, and the punishment is to slash grass. So we did a lot of campaign around that. And as a result, at least one of the perpetrators has been arrested. Uh, the, the case is in court. Uh, but also they have formed a, a, a committee of inquiry to uh, do more research about and investigate this case. That in, before it was in fact neglected, the girl had developed a fissure out of this rape. Uh, her spinal cord was broken out of this. She couldn't access even treatment from the hospital, from the public hospitals in Kenya, a country that in fact has a law that says that survivors and victims of rape will get free access to medical care. But when it comes to practical uh, ways of doing that, it is not in fact the case. So they, she couldn't even access medical care. 
and so it was a, a, an NGO in Kenya uh, called Gender Recovery Center that in fact then uh, took that case up and uh, provided uh, medical care for that. Uh, so it is, uh, it is after this campaign that in fact this case started getting a lot of media attention, other uh, stakeholders taking it up, and, um, and as we speak, she has recovered, she was in a wheelchair when that happened, but now she's walking, she's able to walk, she has recovered, the history has been treated, and the case is in court. And for, so for me, that is change. Um, my Dress, My Choice is also another campaign that has, uh, we started recently, as a result of girls being stripped naked in Kenya, in Malawi, in Tanzania, in Uganda, in different countries, uh, because apparently they are wearing short dresses. Uh, so uh, for us, we thought that is an attack on women's and girls' bodily integrity mm -hmm. and their freedom to, to choose what they want to wear. And so we, start, we started this campaign to say, it's, it's, my, it's, it's my dress, it's my choice. And really, no one should uh, uh, strip another person. And how come the men don't strip women, men, but men are, um, are stripping women or girls? Uh, you know, and uh, and for example, when this thing happened in Kenya, in a country that I thought is very, you know, democratic and for choice, I thought if these things would happen, maybe they are going to happen in Sudan or another country. But I was surprised that they were actually happening in in Kenya. And one of the girls that were stripped naked after a few days committed suicide. Much as they don't want to admit that this contributed to that act. But I believe that, in fact, it is such shame because once you are stripped naked, when you go home, there's a lot of victim blaming that even your own parents might tell you, or I told you, why did you go home wearing that short dress? Why did you go out wearing that tight trousers? You know, and, and, and that kind of victim blaming can, in fact, lead to an act such as committing suicide. But with advocacy that we are doing, uh, and also it, it collided with the time of 16 days of activism, uh, that in fact we did a lot of, you know, we went on the street and started protesting, we have used the social media in terms of Twitter, Facebook, we have tweeted the president, we have tweeted the minister that is in charge of gender issues. And um, when the president came to launch the 16 days of activism, uh, one of the things uh, that he said was that, uh, people have a right to, every person or every citizen has a role to play in protecting uh, marginalized groups of people, including uh, women and children. And we're saying, why, how come people are able to show videos of people that are stripping women, but they're not doing anything about it? You are just watching. Uh, which was good. I, I really liked that kind of statement. The only disappointment I had was the fact that he did not talk about the role of police, the role of his government in protecting women and girls. So we, again, we continue treating him, we continue addressing him and writing articles in newspapers saying he needs to take responsibility and his government is to take responsibility for security of women and girls. And as a result, we have seen that some of the people that uh, are, uh, unaddressed the girls and women have been arrested. So again, there's progress in addressing this issue. Uh, influencing the decisions of heads of states, again, like I said from the beginning, one of the things they would do is to influence African Union uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the outcome of the African Union summits. So, for example, uh, in, uh, I think, 2003, I don't remember the year exactly, uh, but uh, the, the theme of the African Union summit wa was on maternal, maternal health. And through that, we were able to have an um, East African caravan because the summit was taking place in Uganda. And we were able to, uh, in fact, do a lot of advocacy, collect a million signatures, talking about, you know, maternal health of women. And you can see here it reads that no woman should die while giving, uh, giving life. And that was the strong slogan that we carried throughout, uh, which was really to talk about the fact that many women are still dying while giving birth from uh, curable uh, complications, uh, which is really unacceptable. Uh, but also the Great Lakes Region Summit, Heads of State Summit, which was on uh, sexual gender-based violence. 
again, feminine to play a very important role in ensuring that we give key recommendations to heads of states in the Great Lakes region to address uh, sexual and gender-based violence. And that included, uh, in fact, ensuring that we bring women themselves that have faced this issue to speak to heads of states, mm -hmm. to speak to the first ladies, and talk about the issue that affect them, how sexual violence affects them, and what they want their governments to do. So this, again, was such a, a game changer. And we saw that most of the recommendations that we put forward, are, in fact, were adopted in the conclusions of the summit. Uh, I, and here I want to speak about how, in fact, women at the grassroots, women at the regional level, have been able to influence uh, global agendas. And I, I'll just give a few examples. For example, Feminate was uh, uh, the focal point for Africa when NGOs were advocating for establishment of UN women from UNIFEM. As you know, UNIFEM was smaller, it wasn't as big as other UN uh, full, uh, agencies such as UNICEF and others, and we wanted a UN agency that is in fact strong, is, is well resourced to advance the issues of, of women's rights and gender equality in the UN system but also at a global level. So we played a key role in ensuring that UN women get established, and, 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 and it did in fact get established. Um, and so what we are doing currently is also to ensure that UN Women is held accountable to serve the roles and responsibility that we uh, expected them to do uh, when we are advocating for its es establishment. For example, um, I am on the advisory um, committee, the Civil Society Advisory Committee of UN Women Regional Office that is based in Nairobi, Kenya. And so through that advisory role, I'm able to uh, advise the UN Women on key issues that we see and how they should uh, carry out their planning, their programming, uh, their advocacy in terms of women's rights and gender equality issues. Um, the Beijing Platform for Action, which was adopted in 1995. As we speak, uh, we are in, uh, in the process of the regional reviews uh, for this for 20, after 20 years. Uh, but it, this is something that has been reviewed every five years. And it has been playing an important role in mobilizing uh, women across Africa to see that the Beijing Platform for Action remains relevant, it is delivering its promises, uh, but also uh, if there are still gaps, we come up with specific recommendations on how those gaps can be addressed. So with the 20 years, uh, we just had the review uh, actually about two weeks ago, and uh, we were able to come up with key specific emerging issues that are still affecting African women. And we have we, we, we developed those as, 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 as women's race organizations and individuals from different countries, and we were able to carry them with us when the government is doing its own review. So from, from the civil society organizing to influencing the government um, discussions. And we saw that most of the recommendations, again, from our convening, from our consultations, informed the outcome of the government regional discussions. Uh, so, um, so again, that was changed because it is, it is those regional agreements that are going to go at a global level and they will inform the global outcome. Uh, ICPD, that's the International um, Convention on Population and Development, uh, which was adopted in 1994 in Cairo. And again, this, this issue uh, uh, talks so much about women, especially uh, on issues concerning sexual reproductive health and rights. And so, again, we have influenced its adoption, we have influenced the different reviews that have been happening, including the recent one that took place last year. Um, <coughs> then the post 2015 development framework. Uh, I don't know if you have been involved in this discussion, but there have been a lot of discussions around post-2015 post development framework, uh, a development framework that is going to replace the MDGs as they come to the end in 2015, which is next year. And so Feminet is the first organization, uh, women's race organization, but also a social organization in general, that in fact uh, was the first one to see that the consultations are taking place and the, uh, and the role of women, African women in particular, to define their own priorities and to influence that the, the global development agenda in fact puts into consideration the issues affecting African women and girls. 
And so we started mobilizing African women, we started organizing uh, organizations, we started mobilizing other social organizations, uh, engaging with different policy makers, engaging with the UN system, engaging with the high level panel of, of, of eminent people that the UN Secretary General um, Ban Ki Moon put in place to, to work on issues of. of consulting different constituents and come up with a report on post-2015. And our aim was really to ensure that the issues affecting women and girls in Africa are in fact part of the conversation and also they inform the, the next development agenda. And uh, uh, because of that advocacy, we saw that the High Level Panel Report included uh, a specific goal on addressing uh, gender equality and and, uh, and, and, and and overcoming gender inequalities and issues of also women's rights. Uh, also, it uh, somehow tempted to uh, mainstream gender in other goals uh, in their report. We have also seen that uh, the open working group that has been happening, also feminine has played an important role in mobilizing African women to be part of that conversation. It was difficult because these conversations were happening in New York. But we mobilized both resources and, and human resources to ensure that, in fact, uh, every time those conversations were happening, some of the African women went to the UN in the headquarters in New York and spoke about their own experiences and spoke about what they want to see in the development agenda. And, and because of that, then we are seeing that at least the reports that are coming out, they are putting into consideration the issues that we have advocated for, and we have been really advocating for a transformative approach to development uh, uh, that focuses on improvement of our well-being, that, that in fact the, the, the human being is at the center of, of, of this development agenda, and not just counting things, but you know, ensuring that in fact when we talk about development, what does it mean to us? You know, is it just about GDP increase? Is it just about, you know, or is it really empowerment and well-being and improving the well-being of, of, of citizens, including different diversities of, 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 of citizens? Um, so, uh, despite being able, uh, able to do all that, it has not been done uh, without challenges. Uh, and, and the current challenges that we are facing uh, in the area of advocating for women's rights and gender equality, uh, some of the key uh, challenges we face, uh, one is uh, fundamentalism, extremism, and terrorism. As, you, as, 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 as I have already shared, I think you, uh, you saw what happened in Nigeria, the Boko Haram uh, abducting girls. It has been happening in Uganda, in North, in northern Uganda, where Kony again is adopt, adopt, uh, abducting girls and women. Uh, Al Shabaab is happening in Kenya and Sudan and many other countries, and of course, the majority of people that are being affected by all these are uh, women and girls. Uh, as I spoke about before, the, the narrow focus of empowerment, and this is uh, shaping and, 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 and influencing African position in, in the global negotiations such as the post 2015 development framework. If you look at um, the Africa Agenda, um, uh, which is called uh, Africa Agenda 2063, which is Africa vision uh, for the next 50 years. And this came in place last year in May uh, when African Union was celebrating its 50 years. And it is very clear that, you know, um, there is a conversation on the continent to, to see that Africa has its own vision and is driven by its own vision. Uh, but uh, there is a tendency to focus a lot on economic empowerment. Um, uh, which, which, which I think then is a missed opportunity, considering that economic empowerment is important, uh, but it is not the only uh, thing that is important, uh, especially when we talk about women empowerment. Uh, the issues of patriarchal uh, continues, and it, it, uh, and much as we have been trying to change this kind of system, but it is still well and alive, you know. And we are seeing this through attack of women, girls' bodily integrity uh, being affected, but also the uh, shrinking spaces for civil society. Uh, and we are seeing this in different countries. For example, in Ethiopia, if you talk about advocacy for women's rights, 
just mentioning that that's a crime and in fact you are going to be arrested and um, and persecuted as a terrorist mm. so it is that serious that's that's one that that's just one example but in Kenya also there has been uh, conversations around a civil society act uh, um, a law that would limit civil society's operation in terms of you cannot get uh, more than 30% of your finances from outside. And yet we know that most NGOs, most of us, in fact, continue to operate and do what we do through support from outside. So by putting a law in place that states something like that, already you are saying that most of the NGOs will not continue uh, to operate. So it will be difficult to operate in such a kind of uh, uh, legal framework. But it hasn't yet passed, and again, we are advocating that it doesn't pass, but who knows, you know? Uh, just what is below here is just a demonstration of how um, patriarchy continues to affect women, you know? And I've just given different examples of that. Like, for example, there was, been, there was an indecent dressing bill in Nigeria in 2008. There was a mini skirt law in Uganda in 2014. Uh, the traditional courts bill in South Africa, the Anti-Homosexuality Act in 2004 in Nigeria that was passed, mm -hmm. and also in Uganda the same bill was passed in 2014, although uh, uh, lawyers were able to go to, to court and challenge this bill in Uganda, mm -hmm. and, and in fact they won the case, so that's, that's a victory. Mm -hmm. Just watching the time, so that we time yeah. for questions. Yeah. And I think this is the last one, yeah. uh, this is the last slide, where I talk about different opportunities, even within the existing framework. Um, and this demonstrates, uh, you know, a, a, a political will to adverse women's rights. For example, 2010 2020 period was declared by African Union as African Women's Decade, and there are a lot of opportunities with that. Uh, the thematic area of heads of states uh, for 2015 uh, is going to be the year of women empowerment and development towards African Agenda 2063. And again, we are seeing this as an opportunity that, you know, African Union is entirely focusing the entire year just to discuss issues affecting women's empowerment. And we think this will be the opportunity for us to unpack what women empowerment means, <coughs> you know. Uh, but also the post-2015 development process is also another opportunity where we can, uh, in fact, unpack what development means for African women and girls. Uh, the Beijing Plus 20 process, as I spoke about uh, earlier, it is also another, pro is another process that provides opportunity to advocate and to ensure that uh, the emerging issues of uh, women's rights and gender equality are taken into consideration. Uh, and also I wanted to uh, just highlight that Kenya and Ireland actually are going to be co-facilitating the post-2015 negotiations that are starting next year. And I'm seeing that as an opportunity because uh, Feminet is based in Kenya, so we have access to Kenya policymakers. But I'm here in Ireland making connections with you people uh, and you have, I'm sure, access to your policymakers here. And you can influence the agenda uh, in terms of uh, approaching the person who's going to be uh, co-facilitating the post-2015 and just pushing the issue affecting women and together we can work together to ensure that uh, these two co-facilitators are gearing the discussion towards you know a favorable transformative sustainable uh, post 2015 development framework and you know uh, I just wanted to know that you know change begins with me together we can end it and we to uh, build our agency and the struggle continues uh, and we need to work together to do that. Thank you. Lovely. 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 Lovely.